Federalist 60, Part 2. We're going to start with paragraph 3. But before I start reading it, uh, I've got this little highlighted area, and I've probably shown it to you before. But uh, this is the little area where the 13 colonies were at. And look at that compared to the rest of the size of America. And even at that, majority of people were living right here by the Atlantic coast. Okay? And it is very important when you study American history to uh, constantly remind yourself of what, how land and having plenty of it has influenced the growth and formation of American history and government and culture and civilization. One of the first times that it really dawned on me was because I was living in Oklahoma quite a bit and then I traveled to California quite a bit and back and all these big states here, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, huge states. And it's only the first time that when I went uh, I drove around the East Coast, especially Northeast Coast right here, that you, you realize how small those states are compared to the larger states that came afterwards. So that's one of the things you have to constantly remember. And at the same time, another important thing is if one day, I did this one day, I actually um, decided to walk half a day in one of these states just to see how far I can walk, and uh, try to put things in perspective. Back then, all you had was a horse. That was the fastest way you could go on land. And a lot of times you had to uh, carry things on wagons, so that would limit your speed. So it'll give you a good sense of uh, the vastness of this country and how at the beginning and then towards during its growth, it has affected its uh, culture, civilization, um, government, and anything that has any relationship with that. So keep that in mind. So when he says in Federalist number 60 that, uh, or let's say the last Federalist, 59, he says that, well, if the times and places and manners of elections are controlled by the federal government, then you might just find a little district or an area to put the elections in that people from as far areas of that one state can't get to. It's difficult for them. It might take him four days to get there. A farmer can't uh, leave his or family, her family for eight days, you know, go back and forth for the election. So that's why people were making these charges. Um, just remember, it's not like today getting in a car or a plane and going. And here in number 60, like we said in part one, it said, well, the national government can create districts that will be all wealthy people. And Publius says, no, this is not the case. You look at different states, look at uh, the places and times of elections, uh, look at different states, the way population, population is distributed. We don't have any one area where rich people are sitting and uh, we can give them the advantage. He says it's all scattered all around. So let me start with Federalist, I'm sorry, with paragraph 3 of Federalist 60. In addition to this general reflection, there are considerations of a more precise nature which forbid all apprehensions on the subject. The dissimilarity in the ingredients which will compose the national government, and still more in the manner in which they will be brought into action in its various branches, must form a powerful obstacle to a concert of views in any partial scheme of elections. It's reminding the readers of separation of powers said we've got separation of powers. These branches which will be, especially in Congress, will be directly under your control, people, they will check if there's any other branch 
that will overstep its limits. There is sufficient diversity in the state of property, in the genius, manner, and habits of the people of different parts of the Union to occasion a material diversity of disposition in their representatives towards the different ranks and conditions in society. He says there's so many different people, different backgrounds, different manners. People in the North are so different from people in the South, their manner of living. In the South, there's so much slavery and that cultural milieu of the South is different. They are not into commerce. They are more into agriculture, all these stuff, whereas the North is more into commerce. So he says, look, it's not like we've got only one group or two groups of people with two interests. We've got a variety of interests, and that's going to... Uh, actually make it better this way one group's interest won't overwhelm everybody else's because we have multiplicity of interests and manners this will show and the people that uh, different groups will elect to sh to represent them and then that in itself will be a check on um, stop the central government from centralizing power and doing away with state power And though an intimate intercourse under the same government will promote a gradual assimilation of temper and sentiments, yet there are causes, as well physical as moral, which may, in a greater or less degree, permanently nourish different propensities and inclinations in this particular. But the circumstance which will be likely to have the greatest influence in the matter will be the dissimilar modes of constituting the several component parts of, gov of the government. The House of Representatives being to be elected immediately by the people, the Senate by the state legislatures, the President by electors chosen for that purpose by the people, there would be little probability of a common interest to cement these different branches in a predilection for any particular class of electors. So the modes of electing the House of Represent members of the House of Representatives, the Senators, the President, all of these, all of these, the separation of power, the checks and balances will guarantee that only one group, one class of people will not get into the office have multiple people from multiple interests and multiple classes reflected in the members of Senate as well as the House of Representatives. The next paragraph, as to the Senate, it is impossible that any regulation of time and manner, which is all that is proposed to be submitted to the national government in respect to that body, can affect the spirit which will direct the choice of its numbers. Remember in Federalist 59, he said we had to accept this evil, this evil compromise of allowing the states to choose the places of the elections of the senators. Because states were wanting to make sure that they have the ultimate say in the election of the senators and senators, because each state only gets two senators, states' rights and interests will not be trampled upon by bigger states. So he says, we had to make that compromise, giving the places, leaving the places of choosing the senators to the state legislatures. And then he, he continues to say, the collective sense of the state legislatures can never be influenced by extraneous circumstances of that sort. A consideration which alone ought to satisfy us that the discrimination apprehended would never be attempted. For what inducement could the Senate have to concur in a preference in which itself would not be included? Or to what purpose would it be established in reference to one branch of the legislature if it could not be extended to the other? The composition of the one 
would in this case counteract that of the other. And we can never suppose that it would embrace the appointments to the Senate unless we can at the same time suppose the voluntary cooperation of the state legislatures. If we make the latter supposition, it then becomes immaterial where the power in question is placed, whether in the hands, whether in their hands or in those of the union. So basically, again, like I've mentioned before, Madison in the Constitutional Convention with the Virginia plan, he wanted both the state, both the House of Representatives and the senators, the numbers of these two bodies be proportional to their uh, population of the state. And it drove him crazy when they gave equal senators to each state. And, and at the end of the day, when you look at that, that happened because they wanted to make sure that the states stay so powerful, powerful enough to stop the federal government from gobbling up all the power, centralizing all the power. That's why so much power is given to the states, to the Senate, I'm sorry. So uh, Publius here is saying, look, look at how much the Senate has power, how your state legislature will be totally controlling it fully. So do not worry, central government, federal government is not going to do anything crazy like arrange the districts, election districts to be in a way that only a certain class of people will uh, be able to run. So that's crazy.